We have gone live, and in a moment we'll give people time together, and we'll get ready to get started on our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, I, uh, if it wasn't for Becky and Joel, we wouldn't be doing this because I don't know what I'm doing, but uh, hopefully it's going to work out tonight and you all will be able to see. I wish it's where we could interact with one another and you could comment on, uh, on uh, what we're saying and what we're going to talk about tonight. If you want to have your Bible out in just a moment, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 6. And it says by the clock on the computer that it's now 6.30. And I see people are beginning to join us. So I want to begin tonight with just a few quick announcements and uh, uh, challenges for you. I know because of our circumstances, it's really difficult to keep up with everything and everyone we want to be able to because we can't be together. Well, I want to say to you, our drive-in church services have really worked good the last couple of Sundays. I know there's some technological glitches that we have to work out, but we're working on those. And as we go along, we'll, we'll get to the bottom of all of it. But I, I appreciate your prayers and your support. And uh, I know God's been with us through this and his word still goes forth no matter what the format is. And he promised it would never return void. So that's a good thing. Uh, stay in touch with our prayer request. Stay in touch with our bulletin. We don't have a bulletin to hand out, obviously. But uh, summersbaptistchurch.org online. And it's a copy of the bulletin that we put out for this past Sunday. And unfortunately, our copy machine went down this past Sunday and we didn't get to reprint the prayer list. But if you'll stay up with the Summers Ladies Prayer Group, Summers Baptist Ladies Prayer Group. And also, if you are a part of the Summers Prayer Mail team, and if not, get a hold of me or Brother Joel or Sister Shirley Spears, and we'll get you added and, and, and you can be a part of that. Other than that, I hope you're praying for one another. I appreciate your comments and your support, and we're going to be able to get back together here in a few weeks and worship together, and we may still have to practice a little bit of social distancing, but we'll figure out how to do that. Well, I want us to pray together, and uh, as we pray, then we're going to open the Bible to Matthew chapter 6 and read just a few verses, and I want to talk tonight about what Jesus had to say about hypocrisy. All right, let's pray. Father... Thank you that you care about us and everything that goes on in our life. Father, I thank you that you're the God of all comfort and you comfort us in any time of trouble so that we may be able to comfort those who are going through difficulties. So let your ministry of comfort, Lord, be on us and help us to reach out and comfort one another and those around us. Bless this little time of study as your word goes forth. Bless us as we read it and try to teach it. And I pray it will, Father, accomplish the purpose you have planned for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. In a moment, as I've already said, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 are what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And I was just doing a little research recently, and uh, this is the second recorded sermon that Jesus preached. If you sat down and read the whole Sermon on the Mount, three chapters, it'd take you 15 to 20 minutes reading it, what we would call, we preachers would call pulpit rate. But uh, anyway, it, it is very deep. Uh, it, uh, it, it is so deep, I don't know if we'll ever be able to uncover all of the truths. I was interested, I was reading Warren Wiersbe, a great Bible theologian. He said there are so many differing views and opinions about what the Sermon on the Mount really is and what it means and what it represents. He said some people believe, believe that the Sermon on the Mount are steps to salvation. And if you start reading in Matthew chapter 5, you'll notice it's what we refer to and we know as the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers and, and, and all of those. And, and I, don't, I don't think those are steps to salvation. I think if one looks that over, we can see how a person would come to Christ. 
when they admit that they're spiritually poor, they see themselves as spiritually bankrupt, and they mourn over their sins, and, and in meekness they come to Christ. And, and so, in that sense, you might be able to say that. Uh, some, people, some people think that the, the Sermon on the Mount are steps to world peace. And I don't see that in having read it, but I, I can see where somebody might take that out of a few verses. And then some say that it doesn't apply to us at all, that it only has to do with future generations, like uh, during the end time or during the tribulation. Well, I think Jesus knew what he was saying, and he knew what he, who he was talking to, and I think he knew that this would apply to us. So we go over to chapter 6, and, and you know you would almost think, listening to what Jesus has to say, that his hearers were more than his disciples. Now we know the Bible says in, in verse 1 of chapter 5 that there were multitudes around him. And when he was set, when he got in place, it says his disciples came unto him, and then he opened his mouth and he taught them. So at this point, this was probably about the beginning of Jesus' second year of ministry. And it was this popular period. And so these crowds were there and he was teaching them. And his disciples were there. But he had a lot to say about the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, of course, were the, were the religious people of Jesus' day. They were the higher-ups in Judaism. And, and Jesus, in, in these few verses, verses 1 through 8, we're going to read, he really gave it to the Pharisees, all right? So I want to talk tonight about what Jesus taught about hypocrisy. Let me, let me give you this disclaimer, all right? I was always taught if you, uh, if you use somebody else's thoughts, you better give credit. My old pastor and my mentor, Dr. Gerald Keller, used to say, little boy, if my bullet fits your gun, shoot it. Well... This came from Max Licato, the ideas for this tonight, and Max Licato's bullet fits my gun, so I'm going to shoot it tonight, all right? So Matthew 6, verses 1 through 8, he says, Take heed that you do not your alms, which means your righteous acts, your good deeds, your good works, that you do not your good works before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your father who is in heaven. Therefore, based on that statement, when you do your arm alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Now, Let's we'll stop and give you a little disclaimer here in these verses. Most people attribute giving or, or, or doing alms, they, they relate it only to the act of giving, all right? He's going to talk about that specifically, okay? But I think doing alms goes beyond giving. It has to do with all of our so-called good works, all right? He says in verse 4, That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father would seize in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. So he's talking about good works. Most people attribute that to giving. Now he's going to talk about praying. And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites. There he brings it out again, brings them out again. Don't be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you again, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when you've shut the door, pray to your Father who's in, which is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you need of, before you ask him. You know, if you were to ask uh, the question, what is a hypocrite or who is a hypocrite, you might get varied answers. The original uh, language uh, of the word hypocrite that's translated from the original language, what we have now, it meant a play actor. 
It meant someone who put on a mask and pretended to be someone they weren't, pretended to be someone else. And, and you can see, if, if you read all of this, Jesus, Jesus talks in, 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 in these chapters, don't do as the Pharisees do. And now he's, he's referring to them as hypocrites. Don't do as the hypocrites do. So Jesus was saying they were play acting. They weren't really who they were pretending to be. All right. Now, uh, I think another good definition of a hypocrite, and it, and it follows that same course, is someone who claims to be saved, but they're not saved, and they're just pretending to be saved. All right. And, and if that's true, if you go back to the last, in Matthew chapter 7, about verses 20 and on, he said uh, that many would say to him in that day, Lord, we prophesied in your name, cast out devils in your name, did many wonderful works, but he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. So uh, those would be true hypocrites in that sense. So here's some things I want you to understand about that. Jesus was not saying, do not do good works. Uh, we Baptists have a tendency to shy away from good works because we don't believe that you get saved by doing good works. But I want to tell you something I do believe. I believe if you're a child of God and you've been saved by God's grace, it's going to be evident in your life because of the works, the good works you do. In fact, James talked about that. He said, if you have faith, say you have faith. I'd rather you show me. How do you show me your faith? You show me by your works. So, so he's not condemning doing good. Uh, he's not even condemning don't let your works be seen. All right? And, and what he was saying was don't do it just so you will be seen, just so people will see and, uh, and, and be able to watch it. All right? Uh, you know, some of our works are in public. People who have the gift of teaching, it's a public gift. And, and, you know, a lot of times people come by and say to their teacher or their preacher, hey, great job, but we have to learn to take that as it is given and turn that into glory to God. Otherwise, we'll lose the reward of the gifts that God's given us, all right? So uh, sometimes we have to be seen in order to have impact, but that's not the reason we do it. <clears throat> Uh, Max Lucado said to do a good thing is to do a good thing. So we need to remember that. Well, let's talk about the damage that hypocrisy does. You know, when we read what Jesus had to say, he said they have their reward. Those that do their alms, do their good works, do their good deeds to be seen of men, they have their reward. Those that stand in the synagogues and on the street corners and they pray long prayers and they use vain repetitions in their prayers, and they do it to be seen of men. They have their reward. But I don't want you to think that, that the acts and the deeds of a hypocrite, although they may look good to many, hypocrisy turns people away from God. Now, if I've heard it said one time, I've heard it said at least a thousand times and maybe more than that. Talk to somebody, why don't you go to church? Why don't you come to church? Well, I don't go to church, preacher, because there's too many hypocrites in the church. And I know you've heard that. I've heard that. I've said before that people said that. I've never thought that. But the greatest response I've ever heard to that statement was, well, what better place for them to be? If they're hypocrites in the church, they're not going to have an opportunity to be any better than there are. Uh, Philip Yancey wrote a book here a few years ago, and I think the title of it was No Perfect People Allowed or No Perfects Allowed. And in the book, he said, he said, if you drive by our church and you see people standing outside smoking and that offends you, he said, probably you wouldn't feel comfortable coming in our church. Because he said, when you come into our church, you're going to find people addicted to alcohol and you're going to find people addicted to gr drugs. And you're going to find people who are sleeping with other people that they're not married to. And he went on down the line and said all of those things about those different people and the sins that were in their life. But he said they need to be there because they need to hear the word and they need to get better. Well, I would say the word needs to go to those folks. So, you know, and somebody else also said one time, well, 
If a hypocrite standing between you and God, that means they're closer to God than you are. So hypocrisy, though, does turn people away from God. It, 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 it makes them ill toward organized religion. Let me read to you a, a different uh, interpretation, a different translation of Matthew 6, 1, all right? He says, when people enter a church to see God yet can't see but God because of the church, don't think for a second that God doesn't react. Listen to this. Be especially careful when you are trying to do good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, there it goes to the play acting, but the God who made you won't be applauding. You have your reward right there. So hypocrisy turns people away from God, and I think hypocrisy also turns people against God, all right? Uh, I, I think, well, it goes to another sermon altogether, but, but I think there's going to be brokenness for believers in judgment because we weren't always who we said we are and we didn't act like we said and we turned people from God and that's going to be a serious time. Well, Jesus gave some warnings about hypocrisy in this verse and uh, I'll, give, I'll give these to you pretty quickly. We'll talk about them briefly, all right? How do we make sure we take hypocrisy as serious as God does? Well, First of all, we need to make sure that we don't expect any credit for what we do for God. Let me say that again. We need to make sure that we don't take any credit for what we do. None. And if someone notices and, and you aren't disappointed because they noticed, in other words, you relish in what they've said, uh, oh, you're the best... You're the best Sunday school teacher I've ever heard in my life. You're, you're the best preacher I've ever heard. If, if that doesn't make you push back, and that doesn't get you to a point where you say no, uh, and you might not say it then because you don't want to be argumentative, but in your heart you know that's not true. If you start believing it, then you're starting to accept credit for what's done. If somebody says good things, give credit to God. Well, praise the Lord. God's good, isn't he? Here's a good question. If no one knew of the good I do, would I still do it? If nobody knew of the good I do, would I still do it? If not, you're doing it to be seen of people. I remember hearing about a story, and I've shared this many times. It happened in a, in a uh, big congregation, and they were raising money to, uh, to, to go toward a building project. And so the preacher was asking people to stand up and, and to pledge to give so much. And uh, there was kind of a competition going on between certain people. And I've seen that before in congregations, as probably you have too. But anyway, this fellow got up. He went to a microphone and he said, Well, I was going to give my pledge, give my donation a little bit earlier but I couldn't get to a microphone. If you let that sink in for just a moment, he wanted to make sure everybody heard what he was pledging to give. I think he had his reward. And then I, I love this phrase where Jesus said, when he was, and we know he's talking about giving in this respect of the alms, don't sound the trumpet. Man, there's so much discussion about what that really means. And uh, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I'm already going longer than I intended to. Some people think that that uh, in that setting, some of the, the most religious people would actually send a literal trumpeteer to go ahead of them, to blow the trumpet, to get people's attention, to say, hey, brother so-and-so is going to be giving his alms, giving his money, doing good deeds, or he's going to be saying his prayers in just a moment. If it applies specifically to money in this sense, I kind of like the interpretation of sounding the trumpet, <clears throat> and and pardon me, <clears throat> I didn't really fully understand that, understood that till my kids were little, and we went into McDonald's, and they had that big funnel, and you could toss money in that funnel, and you hit it, it'd start going round and round and round and round and round until it finally got to the bottom. Excuse me. If if they had 
apparatus like that in Jesus day <coughs> pardon me probably made out of brass and I can only imagine the noise they would make <coughs> me if if somebody came up and put their coins in whatever it was we know that whatever they were doing whether it was an actual trumpet sounding or put it in where it made a lot of noise to attract people's attention whatever it was they were doing it <coughs> To be seen. They were doing it so people come up and them, oh, say, man, you know, you amaze me. Look what you gave. You know, somebody said money stirs up the phony within us. And by the way, it's within all of us because we all have a tendency to be hypocritical sometimes. You know, if you give to someone in need, he said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Uh, I've known of instances where preachers uh, knew who and what every one of those who's in the church gave, and that's none of my business. That's none of anybody's business between you and God. Now, I may preach on giving, and I may go a little deeper than that. So, I finally want to close tonight by saying don't fake spirituality. When you go to church, don't just, just take a seat to be seen. Or sing just to be heard. If you raise your hands in worship, don't raise your hands in worship just to be seen. You better make sure they're holy ones, not showy ones. I stole that from Max Lucado. When you talk, don't doctor your vocabulary with trendy religious terms. Nothing nauseates God and people more than a fake praise the Lord or a shallow hallelujah or an insincere glory to God. You know, the truth of the matter is, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And if everybody knew me like I know me, they wouldn't like me. And a lot of people don't like me anyway, but I can live with that. But God knows me and he likes me and loves me anyway. But he wants, me, he wants to make me be better and do better than I am. Make sure that we're not hypocritical. Make sure that we're not doing what we do just to be seen of people. Well, I want to tell you, church, I love you. And I know uh, it's been difficult not to be together, but I'm glad God's let me be your pastor. And I'm trying to learn how to be a pastor with this dense distancing going on. But uh, anyway, be sure and send your prayer requests in. Hope to see you Sunday morning. We're going to do drive-in church again. It'll also be Facebook Live. And if you'll look, Brother Joel has posted a link the uh, services we have recorded already, there's now a YouTube link. You can go watch them on YouTube, and there's no break. There's no separation of the music and the preaching part of the service. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love and grace, and thank you that you care about us. Lord, help us to be real. Uh, help us to be authentic, but Lord, help us to act like your children. Help us to be full, be full of grace and truth, Father. Lord, we know we're going to stumble. We're going to fall. We're not perfect. We don't use that as a crutch. We just own it, Lord, because it's who we are. And we thank you that you love us like we are. And you didn't say that you would uh, uh, change us so you could love us. Lord, you decided to love us so you could change us. So help us to be what you want us to be. Thank you for Summers Baptist Church. And Lord, I thank you for the people. Lord, you've caused the church to leave the building. So help us to be the church in the world. In Jesus' name, amen.